Welcome to the MSing About YouTube channel. While I have MS, the emphasis is more on messing about than MS itself. I might choose to chat about those so-called good old days of the 50s and 60s when I was a kid, or share some anecdotes about my travels, recall brushes with fame I've had, who knows. Let's kick off with a wander down memory lane. When I was a kid, Christmas came with thrippences and sixpences in hot plum pudding and gift wrapped socks and undies under the tree. And it usually came with one big ticket item from Santa. Something like a push bike or a transistor radio or a watch or a cricket bat. Now the bat I got was a beauty, but it came with the equivalent of batteries not included. It needed to be treated with linseed oil before you could use it. The only bat I'd used before was my older cousin Roger's. Roger was the older brother I never had. This is young Rog. I think I inherited these boxing gloves from him. And maybe even my teddy bear. This is Percy. Percy, this is YouTube. You see, I didn't need an imaginary friend because I had Percy and Roger. Now Roger lived in Tuma, 22 miles away from Gundagai where I lived. And we'd visit most weekends. We'd play with his Meccano set or jacks with real sheep knuckles. But back to his bat. We also played French cricket. His bat was old and battered and bruised and nothing like my brand new shiny strip of willow with its stunning red handled snood. For weeks and weeks I diligently brushed the blade with oil, morning and night until it took on a tan as it hardened. How proud I was when I offered the bat to Roger to use in a real game of cricket. Out he strode. Facing a fast bowler, he took two steps down the pitch and took an almighty swing and whack! The bat split between the handle and the shoulder and was dangling in the breeze, neither use nor ornament. Roger felt guilty, did the best he could to say sorry. He gave me the old bruised and battered bat. And to me, it was worth more than a dozen new bats. And these boxing gloves always remind me of the annual Guy show. I've got lots of fond memories of the show. The livestock, the produce, fairy floss, Shetland pony rides, the merry-go-round, wood chopping, laughing clowns, metal duck shooting galleries, and attractions up Sideshow Alley like the six-legged sheep, Samson the strongman and Bubbles the stripper. Woohoo! And the big draw card was Jimmy Sharman's boxing tent, with the bass drum pounding and a spruker shouting, a round or two for a pound or two. This enticed locals full of bravado or beer or both to take on his troop of indigenous pugilists. And they had names like Dave Sands or Jackie Green or the Black Irishman or Lightning Williams. There's a mention of a boxing troop in my mate Dave Pryor's memoir. His dad took young David to the boxing tent at the Alice Springs show to see what he was made of. Turned out he was made of blood. Now, did you have slide night when you were a kid? We did. And for this slide night, I'm in a New York state of mind. A lot of people know about New York's famous Chelsea Hotel, which was home to heaps of famous musos and actors and movie directors. Sid Vicious killed his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen in room 100. Dylan Thomas was staying in room 205 when he died. Bob Dylan, who took his surname from Dylan Thomas, lived in room 211. Jim Morrison lived in 722. Jimi Hendrix in 430. And down the hall, Leonard Cohen lived in 424, while Janis Joplin was staying in 415. That's where they had their famous affair, immortalised in Leonard Cohen's song, Chelsea Hotel Number no. 2. She was giving me head on the unmade bed while the limousines wait in the street. It's part of the soundtrack of my adolescence. And when my writing partner Doug Edwards and I went to New York in 1991 to try and make it in America, which we didn't spectacularly, we decided to splash out and stay at a lesser known Algonquin Hotel. The Algonquin was famous for its round table where writers and critics would meet for lunch just to take their wits for a walk. And they called themselves the Vicious Circle. They also called themselves the Board and loved it when the hotel gave them a dedicated drinks waiter by the name of Luigi because he was their Luigi Board. Mm. 
Now, one of those writers was Dorothy Parker. And here are a few of her gems. Brevity is the soul of lingerie. Serves me right for putting all my eggs in one bastard. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Oh, one more drink and I'll be under the host. You can lead a whore to culture, but you can't make her think and tell him I was too fucking busy, or vice versa. Now, I have a clever writing mate who's better known as an actor, Shane Withington. Shane's best known for playing Nurse Brendan Jones in a country practice in the 1980s and lifesaver John Palmer in Home and Away for the last 14 years. I met Shane when Doug Edwards and I wrote a stage show for him and Grant Dodwall called Everybody Makes Mistakes. It was just after they'd left ACP. And Shane and I hit it off and then discovered we both lived on Sydney's northern beaches. And we both had a small child the same age, so we caught up for coffees and drinks or, or a sail or a muck about with the kids in the park. Now, Shane and I had a couple of ventures that didn't exactly set the world on fire. One was a TV show that combined comedy with cooking. I was the writer, Shane was the chef. And it was aimed at showing blokes how to cook, and we called it First Burn the Onions. And we made a pilot, and we pitched it to Channel 7, and here was the thing. We planned to get the show underwritten by product placement. You know, a supermarket like Coles and or people like Master Foods, that sort of thing. And the network knocked it back. Hmm, how silly of us. Who in their right mind would think that people would want to watch a stupid cooking show? Shish. And I recall one night on Shane's yacht on Pitwater, one of us dropped something while fishing off the back of the boat and we got talking about how handy it would be to have a bright torch as part of the handle on a fishing rod. You know, so you could bait the hook or find those dropped keys or have a good close look at your mate. And back on land, we hit the sports shops. No one had heard of a rod with a torch, but what a great idea we came up with. Oh yes, so encouraged and enthusiastic, we came up with the itty bitty rod light and paid a patent attorney a lot of money to get our copyright on the next big thing. We didn't get rich because a Japanese tackle manufacturer already had a patent on it, but had chosen just to own the rights, not to release it. Bugger. It's funny how failure can give you fonder memories than success. In fact, that could be the title of my memoir, My Life as a Successful Failure. I mean, let's have a look at my Australia. This is a book I wrote about Australia, The Small Guide to a Big Country. It never warranted a reprint, so I guess it's one of my failures. Let's head to the coast. First, the most easterly point in Australia, Cape Byron, Byron Bay. I can't afford to live in Byron Bay, but I had a great holiday there once. And that's my son James, doing the most easterly point in Australia. It's a clever boy. Now, the town itself had a lovely laid back vibe and the beaches were fabulous. I went swimming and skimboarding, surfing, scuba diving. I even had a dolphin share a wave with me at Wadigo's beach. And I got to dive with turtles and sharks. But the highlight was where we stayed. We rented one of the keeper's cottages next to the lighthouse. Now, as you can imagine, the views were sensational. And while there were heaps of day trippers during the day, they locked the gates at dusk and the whole place is yours. And from memory, it's not that expensive for what you get. There's two or three bedrooms, a lounge room, a large lawn with an outside barbecue, a nice bathroom and a kitchen. We invited a Swedish couple we'd met on the beach for an Aussie roast and we had a lovely night. But the best bit, having that sunrise all to yourself. And you can still rent them now. Now, I don't know if you've been following the MSing About podcast with my sidekick Katrina. They've all been about nothing in particular. Pretty much one of us will come up with a topic and we'll see where our heads take us. Like chickens and eggs. There's a chicken. And there's an egg. Which one came first? Well, the chicken in this case, because the eggs were in aisle three. Aha. Now, in a recent podcast, we somehow seamlessly got 20 minutes worth of banter about eggs. Who'd have thought? Cookies, bum nuts, cackleberries. We talked about raw eggs, good eggs, bad eggs, rotten eggs, rotten egg gas. 
Easter eggs, fertilised eggs, poached eggs, fried eggs, scrambled eggs, hollandaise eggs, eggs benedict, Russian eggs, souffles, sponges, stracciatella soup, Caesar salad eggs, deviled eggs, curried eggs, scotch eggs, eggs sunny side up, eggs sunny side down, free range eggs, pasteurised eggs, God, we even cracked a few excellent yolks. And here's a bit of trivia I learned. There are 100 ways to use eggs in cooking, and that's why there are 100 folds in a chef's hat, which incidentally is called a tok. That's an Arabic word for hat. And I'll leave you with some words of wisdom passed down from my grandmother. She used to say that kissing a man with a moustache was like eating an egg without salt, whatever that means. And how many men did she kiss? Well, grandfather didn't have a mo. Yes. And those for chickens. Did you know that they can dream, that they can solve puzzles, that they have great memories and can recognise over a hundred faces, and that you should never give them names, otherwise you wouldn't be able to kill them. Now, my father won this trophy for the best poultry at the Tumut Show in 1933. Wonder if he gave his chooks names. Anyway, I gave this one a name. It's lunch. I hope you enjoyed this MSing About episode. Please like, share, subscribe, check out our Facebook page and our website msingabout.com.au. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.